Welcome to Jaypal's Idea Handbook webinar series. I'm Iqbal Dhaliwal, the Global Executive Director of Jaypal and a co-chair of Jaypal's Idea Initiative. These webinars accompany the release of the handbook on using administrative data for research and evidence-based policy funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. The handbook provides a series of technical guides and case studies on how to make administrative data more accessible for research and policy. Today's webinar is based on the chapter titled The Use of Administrative Data and the International Monetary Fund, and it is my pleasure to introduce its authors. Federico Diaz is an economist at the Structural Reforms Unit of the IMF's Research Department. Ira Dabla Norris, the Mission Chief for Vietnam and Division Chief at the IMF's Asia-Pacific Department. Earlier, she was Division Chief at the Fund's Fiscal Affairs Department. Romaine Duval is the Head of the Structural Reform Unit in IMF's Research Department. This case study features the unique institutional background of administrative data use at the IMF and how data use may play a growing role in their technical assistance and research. Given the large number of countries where the IMF has technical and policy engagements, the unique legal context of data use at a multilateral organization like the fund, and the efficiency and cost gains to policymakers of data use, this case study presents a very different perspective on data use from many of our other chapters. Many thanks to Ida, Federico, and Romain for this outstanding contribution to the handbook. Following the talk, we will have a live question and answer session. So please continue to type in your questions, even during the presentation, in the chat box right below this video. I will discuss these with the authors after their talk. With that, I hand it over to Ida and Federico for their presentation. Good morning. I'm Federico Diaz with the International Monetary Fund. I'm one of the co-authors, along with my colleagues Eda Dablanoris and Roman Duval, of the chapter on the use of administrative data and the IMF. Before we get started, let me just state that the usual disclaimer applies. All views expressed in the chapter and on this presentation are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent those of the IMF, its executive board, or IMF management. Let's start with a bit of an institutional background on the International Monetary Fund. What does the IMF do? The IMF has three main functions. First, it conducts macroeconomic surveillance of its member countries and of the global economy. Second, it provides financial assistance to member countries in need. And third, it also provides technical assistance for capacity building purposes. So let's zoom in into each of these to get a better idea of what they are and how they relate to the use of administrative data. The first function, macroeconomic surveillance and research. This means monitoring member country policies and economic and financial developments at the national, regional, and global levels. The IMF advises member countries and promotes policies to foster economic stability, reduce vulnerability, and raise living standards. In practice, this means that IMF staff visit every member country, 190 of them, usually every year, as part of the so-called Article 4 consultation with the authorities. The IMF also provides periodic assessments of the economic prospects through its flagship publications, like the World Economic Outlook, the Global Financial Stability Report, the Fiscal Monitor, the External Sector Report, as well as various regional economic outlooks. The fund's second function is to provide financial assistance, that is loans, to member countries that are experiencing actual or potential balance of payment problems. This could happen to multiple countries simultaneously whenever there is a global crisis, so quite timely nowadays. When engaging with countries on this, the IMF works in close cooperation in the design of the adjustment programs that will help countries recover. Importantly, the ongoing financial support is dependent on the effective implementation of such programs, and we will come back to this later on. Finally, the third main operation consists in providing technical assistance and training to help countries improve their economic institutions and to strengthen related human capacities. 
such technical assistance missions entail the design and implementation of programs aiming to increase the efficacy of public policies across a very broad range of topics, from tax policies and expenditure management to monetary and exchange rate policies, and from banking and financial system supervision and regulation to economic statistics. Now, does the IMF typically use administrative data? Yes and no. It really depends on the fund operation being considered. Technical assistance missions and lending programs usually do involve some access to administrative data. Why is that? Because to provide assistance on improving the efficiency of a given policy or in designing a new specific policy altogether, IMF staff should be able to access the granular data collected by government agencies in order to make the most informed assessments. Likewise, oftentimes, to assess whether the conditions of a lending programs are being met also requires accessing granular data collected by governments. It should be highlighted, however, that in both these cases of technical assistance and lending programs, it is the member country that one that reaches out to the fund. Thus, they are really demand-driven in nature, and therefore, governments are usually well inclined to grant access to their data. But in contrast, surveillance and research usually do not use administrative data, or at least that has been the case until recently. We'll talk in more detail later, but surveillance and research traditionally have been conducted and proficiently without using administrative data. This was partly because of the state of the art. Simply think of academic research just 10 or 20 years ago, and also because of the costs involved, even opportunity cost, for instance, in terms of staff's time. That said, there is a growing recognition within the fund that using administrative data helps provide better targeted policy responses and more granular assessments. Against this background, the IMF faces some unique challenges and opportunities when it comes to the use of administrative data. As an international organization, the IMF has some very distinctive characteristics. First, all member countries agree to provide some data to the fund, although not necessarily administrative data. Still, this certainly is a starting point that is already in place. Second, the IMF has immunity from judicial process, which in some way may hamper traditional enforcement mechanisms used in data agreements. At the same time, however, it also has strong protections when it comes to confidential information. Inviolability is the technical term here, which provides assurances to governments that data shared with the IMF will not be seen by others unless they have their explicit consent. Finally, since IMF staff has regular face-to-face -face access to authorities, again, due to surveillance, lending, and or technical assistance missions, the fund is in a unique position to engage in dialogues that could lead towards accessing administrative data. And without any further ado, now ERA will start commenting on some specific examples on the use of administrative data at the IMF. Thank you, Federico. My name is Ira Dablin-Norris. I'm the mission chief to Vietnam in the IMF's Asia and Pacific Department. I will now give you some examples of how administrative data was used for research and policy purposes uh, in, in the fund. Uh, here I'm going to focus on two different projects that I led in two entirely different uh, contexts. Uh, the first example is where my team in the IMF's Fiscal Affairs Department, where I was working previously, examined the impact of electronic transmission of VAT, or value-added tax, invoice information, so this is called e-invoicing in short, on revenue collections in uh, Peru. Our research was motivated by the findings of uh, the IMF's 2015 uh, technical uh, assistance assessment of revenue gaps in Peru, and this had highlighted weaknesses in the VAT collections and pointed to the introduction of e-invoicing as a potential tool for increasing revenue collections. By way of background, uh, VAT compliance is challenging for many developing countries because false or altered invoices can be used to overclaim um, input tax credits. So by digitalizing transactions data, the presumption is that e-invoicing will allow for greater oversight on the part of the tax authorities 
uh, it could increase the probability of evasion detection and thereby encourage uh, greater voluntary uh, compliance. A key question uh, of interest to the Peruvian tax authorities, SUNAT, was whether the e-invoicing reform that they had adopted had actually achieved its intended objectives and for which type of firms uh, had compliance improved the most. From the IMF's perspective, this question was also a broader uh, relevance, particularly for our technical assistance work, as a number of emerging market and developing countries around the globe uh, had introduced uh, e-invoicing in recent years, the, but there were very few studies uh, assessing the efficacy um, of this reform. So my team saw an opportunity uh, here what made evaluating Peru's tax reform interesting from a research standpoint was that e-invoicing was introduced in a sequential and staggered manner. So we knew that we could exploit the quasi-experimental variation in the reform uh, rollout. In other words, the reform design allowed for precise comparison of firms that were uh, already required to digitalize against similar ones that had yet to do so. So how do we do this? Well, to evaluate the reform, we needed a comprehensive data set of uh, all firms' monthly uh, tax reports uh, in Peru. Uh, but given the confidential nature of the taxpayer level data and also the large size of the data set itself, we knew that we couldn't directly access uh, the data. But again, here we were fortunate uh, in that the IMFs very strong relationship with SUNAT, the Peruvian tax authority, uh, that has been forged uh, um, due to ongoing technical assistance uh, provision uh, on revenue administration uh, issues, um, led not only to the endorsement of the study by the tax authority, but also to a strong commitment on their part to do this jointly. Uh, we agreed with uh, Sunat to design the analysis and to work remotely. Essentially, we send scripts to a designated point person within the tax authority. And this point person had some in-house skills to run the scripts. But we also made a concerted effort to build capacity and, and to ensure transfer um, of knowledge. It was also clear uh, from the outset that uh, just relying on remote working would not be sufficient to advance uh, the project and some kind of on-site work would be required to both refine the analysis, but also to resolve any potential challenges uh, that we encountered. However, the reform evaluation itself fell outside the purview of the IMF's uh, standard technical assistance uh, activities, and so funding was, was going to be an issue. But here again, we were fortunate, uh, as around the same time, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation had entered into a partnership uh, with the IMF's Fiscal Affairs Department to advance uh, research and practice um, on using digital technologies uh, for improving public finance. And then the focus was really going to be on emerging market and developing countries. And financial support was going to be provided by the foundation to advance this agenda, both within the fund, but also to showcase this more broadly to our country membership. So our, my team, we outlined a proposal to use these funds um, for short visits um, in um, Peru and to organize joint uh, seminars um, with uh, SUNAT uh, in order to discuss uh, the initial findings, to share know-how uh, uh, in terms of working with administrative data, but also to solicit uh, inputs from various stakeholders, both within uh, SUNAT, but also other international institutions such as the IDB that had been providing uh, technical assistance to Peru in related uh, contexts. So all of this work uh, culminated in a co-authored um, IMF working paper and a, and a revise and resubmit uh, from the Journal of Public Economics that my team is still working on. Uh, more importantly, SUNAT found the interaction to be very useful for presenting the findings um, of, 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 of the analysis to ministerial level decision makers, as well as to highlight the value of the research that they were uh, conducting. Within the IMF, the analysis was also used uh, in the country surveillance on Peru, and it also helped spark similar engagement uh, with other countries in, in technical assistance uh, contexts. Uh, since this first round engagement with SUNAT was successful, both us and uh, SUNAT were eager to further exploit the value of administrative data to ask other 
uh, related uh, questions of interest. Um, I should note that uh, our engagement has made the Peruvian Tax Administration to be also more open to outside researchers utilizing tax administration data and using similar types of data sharing and use protocols uh, as uh, were put in place for my team. We now have a follow-up project uh, with SUNAT that uses transactions level data to examine and to quantify spillovers in e-invoicing uh, adoption, that this is ongoing. Um, and we're also in the process of organizing a webinar next month with, uh, with uh, SUNAT to discuss our preliminary results and policy implications and, and to solicit their views. So the second case that I'm going to talk about uh, is an example of how country engagement um, in the context of surveillance, in, the con in this case, uh, Vietnam, uh, allowed us to, to get access to administrative data and, and, and buy in for continued engagement. Um, as I mentioned, I'm currently working as uh, the IMF Mission Chief uh, on Vietnam, and my team put together a, a joint proposal, uh, an agenda, um, with the General Statistical uh, Office of Vietnam to access their confidential firm level census and other uh, administrative data that they have, uh, which is not readily available uh, to uh, researchers. Uh, the initial idea was really just to shed light on um, resource misallocation across firms and, and productivity developments and, and look at the impact of reforms uh, that had been implemented to date in an economy that is undergoing you know, very rapid uh, structural transformation. And this was a, a topic of interest to the Vietnamese policymakers um, as well. We discussed the contours of the project extensively with the GSO and provided assurances uh, that the data would only be used for the intended um, purposes. But then COVID hit, um, and uh, we were actually very fortunate to have this engagement in place um, with the authorities as we could you know, quickly shift gears and, and start focusing on the impact of the pandemic on the corporate sector. And this is because we could use the firm level census to examine how vulnerable firms in Vietnam were even prior to the crisis. So essentially what we did is we, 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 we took our forecasts on economic growth and we mapped them into sectoral revenue uh, losses across uh, different sectors. And based on the terms of the firm's outstanding debts and assumptions on the evol uh, evolution of costs, we could project uh, liquidity and solvency positions of uh, firms. Uh, and we could also assess whether the policy measures that have been put in place uh, by the government would help, whether or not they would help alleviate corporate vulnerabilities uh, and, and for instance, how SMEs uh, would fare as a result of the, of the, of the COVID shock and, and, and policy measures that were put in place. All of these types of questions were clearly uh, of uh, uh, topical and, and of interest uh, to the Vietnamese authorities um, as well. As in the case of Peru um, and the uh, Peru e-invoicing project, my team did not have direct access to the firm level uh, census data. Uh, so we had a designated uh, point a person or actually several people in the GSO to work remotely uh, with my team. The challenge here was that the specific office in the GSO hosting the data was really not very well versed in statistical packages such as data and, and other types of econometric uh, analysis. So we actually hired a local university professor to provide on-site uh, assistance with running the scripts and to serve as a go-between between my team and the statistical um, office. I should add here that funding for such activities is not readily available, uh, but we were able to scrounge around uh, for funds and somehow make this happen. And I think uh, academics and other uh, um, uh, researchers will well appreciate uh, how, how challenging this can be at times. But it was worthwhile because the initial engagement culminated in, in a policy note that was jointly co-authored with staff from the GSO. And this was shared um, at the ministerial level with the Minister of Planning and Investment and other uh, important agencies uh, within uh, uh, the Vietnam uh, very early on uh, in the pandemic. We also wrote a joint um, IMF working paper that we organized a webinar, a webinar with the GSO to share the results of our analysis more broadly with different stakeholders in the Vietnamese uh, government and to spark a debate as to whether the policies that they, they had put in place, the government had put in place were appropriate and what more uh, could and should be uh, done. 
So the publicity that was uh, that was garnered by the project within uh, um, the, the, the country and the close uh, working relationship with the GSO has helped get buy-in for future uh, engagement. In fact, my team is working on uh, currently working on a number of projects jointly with the GSO using administrative data to address you know, a range of policy questions. And we're also trying to nudge and provide input into how new surveys uh, could be developed for uh, purposes of policy um, evaluation. So what does this all mean uh, going forward? Um, I should note that um, IMF teams are increasingly doing joint research uh, with authorities where um, data access is, is, is problematic. So this is in Japan and Norway and in Denmark and a number of other countries. Um, we're also making use of data labs uh, within countries in, in such as Mexico and Brazil and, and trying to access administrative data to evaluate uh, policies or to shed light on pertinent issues of interest to the fund's membership and to help countries prioritize, better prioritize policy actions. But we also need to build um, on this momentum to ensure uh, continued uh, success. And here there are trade-offs uh, to contend with uh, when we consider how the administrative data the fund could potentially have access to could be used more systematically for purposes of policy analysis and research and perhaps even be made available for other outside uh, researchers. One as aspect um, I should note has to do with costs. And here, while financial costs associated with access can often be low, costs related to staff time or travel, particularly if access requires physical presence in the country, can be high. And some of this has to do with institutional uh, protocols. Uh, just getting access to the data itself can be a, you know, a time-consuming uh, endeavor. To, 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 just to give you a sense, the data on Vietnam that my team finally had access to was not made available to my predecessors and took considerable engagement and, and initiative on our part to engage uh, uh, with the statistical uh, office uh, and, and, and to essentially show proof of concept, uh, which has allowed for this uh, engagement. But even in cases where countries compile administrative data and make this available uh, to us, uh, easily available to us, considerable time can be spent just cleaning and processing the data. And so incentives here uh, play a role. Um, this process can be challenging because um, there's sometimes our projects have very short uh, time horizons. For instance, the World Economic Outlook, you know, happens every six months. Um, Article 4 consultations for most countries are on an annual uh, basis. So the time that is required to sort of set up, say, a randomized evaluation and to, to actually uh, do the, the, the data work can be very long. Uh, and this means that uh, IMF time, uh, IMF staff may not have sufficient time to invest in the data sets, uh, which require significant cleaning and manipulation before they can be useful, or even setting up uh, experiments or, 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 or uh, in the first place. Another consideration is that the IMF is typically interested in conducting cross-country analysis in order to have broad-based uh, evidence on which we base our policy uh, recommendations. However, you know, using administrative data uh, on a cross-country basis can be extremely challenging since countries collect data in different formats very, and use very different measures uh, for outcomes. Um, and the, the types of, of data sets that this can be that you can have cross country comparability also uh, vary. Um, another consideration has to do with performance metrics, which can differ from that in academia and other organizations and really depend on the nature of the project as each of the IMF's core activities, macroeconomic surveillance and research, lending and technical assistance entail very different uh, objectives. That said, of course, the ultimate goal uh, of the IMF is to provide policy relevant uh, information for senior IMF and national officials and to help them develop appropriate policy recommendations and, and, and actions. And this advice clearly would not be as granular if, access, if we did not have access to administrative uh, data. Another uh, metric of success is interest uh, from the data providers in repeat engagement uh, and, and follow-up uh, projects. 
Uh, this is clearly an indication that the use of administrative data by the IMF can be mutually beneficial for us as well as for the country authorities. But the issue of cross-country comparability of data still remains. Um, the importance of, of, of having cross-country uh, data also raises the question of the potential role um, that the IMF could play in pushing for international standards for data classification and comparability um, of administrative data. One potential long-term path um, would be to follow the approach that the IMF has been using um, in in terms of its balance of payments uh, manual that provides guidance on how to compile balance of payments and uh, related data. Uh, a similar approach towards how countries collect, document, and disseminate administrative data uh, would be a potential path forward uh, in improving the use of administrative data. Some of this could be done um, through existing international fora. For instance, the IMF, uh, together with the Financial Stability Board, the FSB, and other international agencies, have been leading work. I've uh, been leading the work on the G20 uh, Data Gaps Initiative. So over time, this could translate into specific setting specific objectives for countries to compile and disseminate uh, minimum common uh, administrative uh, data sets. Another uh, venue that the IMF has been exploring. Uh, is partnerships with uh, universities and research networks to expand the availability of uh, cross-country co um, comparable uh, data. And this could be used for policy-relevant uh, research, even at, say, the regional level. Uh, one example is a partnership uh, with the Productivity Research Network uh, at the National University of Singapore. Uh, through this collaboration, uh, the Productivity Research uh, Network, PRN, will allow uh, IMF staff to access their firm level data sets, which are based on country level uh, censuses uh, for all available countries and, and to access also access the underlying scripts. In exchange, the, the IMF could support the expansion of, 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 of country coverage um, by reaching out to the relevant uh, country authorities and statistical agencies and encouraging them under their privacy policy to work with the PRN uh, in the data collection uh, exercise. So this is one example of how uh, you know, a, a mutually beneficial partnership uh, could be forged. So let me now conclude by just reiterating uh, a few points. Well, firstly, the intensity and frequency with which administrative data are used uh, at the IMF really depends on the functions that we're looking at. Uh, it depends upon whether it's being used for technical assistance, for lending related purposes, or for macroeconomic surveillance and research. And while the use of administrative data is, is, is relatively common for our technical assistance work and also for, for lending, um, it is much less used in the, in the case of macroeconomic uh, surveillance and, and, and research. Um, but I should add that there is growing recognition within the IMF of the benefits of using these kinds of data for fund surveillance and research. And the successful examples that I've described really do show a, a path forward. And, and many of my colleagues are actually uh, embarking on, on very similar uh, types of projects uh, that, as I have described, in different contexts. At the same time, I think it's, it bears uh, mentioning that the use of administrative data for research and surveillance purposes still really depends on personal initiative and approaching national authorities or data providers. It is not a systematic uh, feature of, uh, of our work. Looking ahead, um, the fund's unique status as an international organization creates opportunities. Uh, in particular, in the future, through its bilateral engagement with its you know, very large membership, uh, participation in international data initiatives and partnerships with universities and other types of research networks, um, the institution has the potential to gradually enhance uh, cross-country uh, comparability access and use for at least some types of administrative data that are produced by national authorities and, and to use this for research uh, uh, and, and policy purposes. Let me stop here. Thank you very much.